the words of our mouths and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I wonder if any of you uh, recall late October 2017. Late October 2017, if you were living here, you remember, well, actually nationwide, many people remember early October 2017 when this town was on fire, but I'm talking about late October, like two and a half, three weeks later when we had just gotten through what I imagined would be the largest widespread cataclysmic event that I thought we would face together in my time in Santa Rosa I was so young then, I had no idea what was coming. And, you know, I, I, I didn't know what I was, I was expecting would be happening in, in late October. Like most folks, for that two weeks between October 8th and October 18th, right around in there, I didn't sleep for, for two weeks. And I, I, I don't know about you if you noticed the entire town was kind of amped up. Right? Everybody was really amped up. There was this sense of collective goodwill. There was even sometimes I noticed this strange giddiness where I would talk to people and we would laugh hysterically about things that, that weren't that funny. There was this sense of energy and urgency and everyone I knew was trying to take care of other people. And then late October came and I felt like felt like many of us fell off of an emotional cliff. Does anyone, anyone else have that experience? I, I found that there was a day, it was probably maybe October 25th or 26th, where I found that I could not get out of bed, right, where it all caught up with me at once. And I, I was exhausted, but I couldn't sleep. I felt deeply lonely, but I didn't want to be around other people. I was just carrying this ball of anxiety that seemed to have nowhere to go. And that's when I decided that I would drive out to the desert, perhaps a little on the nose for being in need of spiritual wisdom, but I was going to be down in Southern California for, for work beyond the local church anyway, and so, so I booked this place to camp in someone's backyard who lived in the, in the Joshua Tree area. It was, it was this lovely space, and my, my camping spot was far from her house but looked out onto the nature preserve. The host knew that I was coming from Santa Rosa, and so she was incredibly accommodating. She upgraded me from my tent to her pop-up trailer at no additional cost. <laughs> she had snacks waiting for me in that trailer. And when I arrived, she asked me what I was planning to do with the three days I was there. And I held up my Bible, and I said, I'm going to read the book of Jeremiah in its entirety. She took a beat before she answered, and she said, well, if that gets dry, honey, I also have a lot of National Geographics. Sometimes, sometimes it's just nice to look at pictures, hmm? I, I confess, I didn't even think we would, we would ever make, well, we won't ever make it through the whole book of Jeremiah, but I wondered if we would struggle even getting through the first part of the first chapter this morning. In, in light of the recent Supreme Court decisions, I imagine some of us might have been a little uncomfortable when we heard the words, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. That's a bit of a rub right now for some of us. And that's why I want to be really clear that this passage is not about when life begins. That's not a question that has been asked throughout Judaism and to, to, to um, place our own understanding of, of a woman's right to choose on this text is to impose a, what is fundamentally a problem between Gentiles and, and largely Christians onto a Jewish text. So I, I want to invite us just to retreat from that a moment because this this text isn't really about Jeremiah. These words aren't really about Jeremiah. What's going on here is that, that God is, is saying who God is. Before I formed you, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you. 
what God is saying has nothing to do about when Jeremiah's life began. It has everything to do about, about who God is. God is ready. Before Jeremiah was even born, God is waiting. God knows who Jeremiah is more than Jeremiah knows himself. God saw Jeremiah coming, and he was coming for a time such as this. God knows everything that Jeremiah has done, is doing, and will do. What do we know, though, about Jeremiah? What do we know about the book of Jeremiah? Anybody? Feel their... It's... <laughs> Uh, Alan just said it's not necessarily pleasant reading. You know, I noticed that. Like, like three chapters in, Alan, I'm sitting there like looking out at this desert, and I'm like, oh, Jesus, and he's not even going to be in this book. We're just going to keep going, <laughs> right? Anybody else, what do you know about Jeremiah? It's not necessarily pleasant reading, but he does a lot. Um, he buys real estate. He does some pottery. Jeremiah does a couple of different things. Does anybody know about the length of the book, though. So this is the longest book in the Bible. By far, it's Jeremiah. It's one guy. It's his exploits, and it goes on for days and days and days. He might be a boy at the beginning, but he certainly isn't by the end. It took me a long time to read Jeremiah when I was sitting out in the desert, and two things happened. First of all, I got terribly sunburned, <laughs> terribly and, 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 and second, I began to understand why it is that Jeremiah is so reluctant to lead. I got to this place of feeling like if I could just acquire a wide brim hat, I would stay in the desert a bit longer. Because what I noticed when I was sitting in the desert reading Jeremiah wasn't that I found spiritual wisdom. It was mostly that I got in touch with my sense of fear and dread, the fear and dread that Jeremiah is expressing early on. I always interpret this as, ah, uh, Lord, truly, I don't, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm only a child. Like, you must have mistaken me with someone else. Clearly, I am not ready for this. It may, be, may have been a long time since any of us would say that we identified as children. But one of the things that, that I try to remind myself of so I can have grace for myself in my life is that in each phase of my life, I am a beginner. Has anyone else noticed this? So I, I, in each phase of my life, I am a beginner. In this next step in my career, I'm a beginner. In this next step in a relationship, I'm a beginner. At every stage of our life, we as Christians who think we live once, this is your first time doing this. It's something I try to remind children and teenagers when they tell me that their parents are idiots. I try to remind them that everyone is beginning this stage of their life for the first time. And so, and so when we face something new, especially something really difficult, it's no wonder that we feel that we feel very, very unprepared. And I think that's especially true for us in this period of time in which every other day it, it seems like there is something else that is called unprecedented. I want to cancel the word unprecedented. It has no meaning anymore. Right? We seem to use it all the time. There are so many new things in our life that we are, that we are afraid to face. Just off the, the top of our heads, can we think about uh, the situations we're facing in our life for which we feel a little wholly unprepared? Climate change. That is, we are all beginners in that this is a, a new reality that we're living in and that our children will live in. Yeah, what else? Aging issues. Aging issues are not for the faint of heart. Yeah, others. Conflict. Conflict. Uh, I agree with that. Conflict, I feel like, is something that is new every time because the parties involved are, are well, we never know how people are going to react, right? So conflict, um, that's a new reality. I, I feel like, um, 
conspiracy theories within the family, that's a new thing for me, um, where I, I feel like there was maybe at a different time, I might have family members who I disagree with on certain things, but now we're in this new stage in which I, I don't know what reality they're living in. And so how am I to engage with these people I love, right? Yeah, Laura. Kids moving away and moving on. Children launching, children rebounding and coming back. All of those are new, new things that some of us are going through. Yeah, yeah. This, it might be a long time since any of us can say, but I am child, a, a child. And yet, in everything that we named, right, I feel like we're still, we're still beginners. And so when, when we show up in those situations, right, we might wonder, how, how is it that I will know what to say or know what to do or, or know how to engage with the situation? God, God has an answer for that. God says, now I will put my words in your mouth. See, on today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms. Now I will put my words in your mouth. That might be the second passage of the text that makes us uncomfortable. I don't know that um, Christ Church United Methodist or many mainline United Methodist churches feel really comfortable imagining ourselves as speaking prophecy, right? Because we've seen that abused so many times, right? We see so many people saying that they're speaking for God. I've heard so many people say hateful and hurtful things and say, well, I'm just, I'm just telling you the truth. There's this, there's this podcast I listen to every so often when I'm preparing for a, a sermon, and it's like four pastors talking about all the texts that you'll read that week. And um, I've listened to it over the years, and I've kind of gotten a sense of who these people are. And quite frankly, three of them are really unhelpful. Three of them are really unhelpful. But the fourth one is very helpful. So I tune in every so often, and I'm like, okay, I'm trying to skip through and get to the point where um, the helpful uh, pastor, her name is, she's the Reverend Dr. Joy J. Moore, and so I skip forward and try to get to, to what Joy is going to say, and it's usually worth the effort of trying to find her words, because for this passage, uh, she acknowledges this concern that we have over what it, what it means to be to, to assume that we have God's words in our mouth. And she said, well, there's, there's a litmus test. There's a litmus test for whether what you're speaking is truly prophecy. And the litmus test for her is in two parts. It gives glory to God, not to yourself. And it makes people who are in power uncomfortable. Those are her two, the two pieces where she has yet to hear somebody say something that gives glory to God and does not lift up that person who is speaking and makes people uncomfortable, people in power uncomfortable, and for it not to be prophecy. Because, because the truth is what, what God speaks through Jeremiah is an, an, an upending of kingdoms. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a calling people to return from exile. It's a resistance to empire. And, and above all, it is reminding the people, Israel, who they are. Jeremiah is, is called to be a prophet, and what Jeremiah is called to do is to call the, the people. Sometimes I think we, we forget that as the, the church. We forget that we are called to call. We forget that we are called to invite other people. And so then we face these, these various cataclysms, these, these, these difficult situations in our lives, and we assume that we face them alone. I, I confess, I often lose sleep with my fear of what's going on with climate change. That fear is so much worse, though, when I imagine that I am facing it alone, when I imagine that I am the only one who has agency in which to act and do something for our planet. Jeremiah is, is called to remind the people of who they are and to testify to how God has called the people Israel to be. How are we called to be God's people? How are we called to show up and to call people in our community? I think there are, there are so many ways in which this, this 
congregation continues to be in service to our wider community, but I want us to also think about how we can invite others to lead and others to serve, who are the, the people in, in our lives who are perhaps on the, the periphery, who are in need of the invitation to be part of what God is doing in our world. We are, we are called, whether we want to be or not. Perhaps we, we think that, that we've winged in our abilities. Perhaps we think that we no longer have much to offer. But, but what God is saying in this text is that God has appointed us now on this day. That the Lord is, is placing uh, the divine hand and touching our mouths that we would speak this truth to our community that we would be appointed over nations and kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant, all for the glory of God, all for the building of God's commonwealth on earth, all for sharing the love that we know through Christ Jesus. Amen. <laughs>